the voice of Jesus, he calls us to worship him. He calls his people worldwide to come, to stay a while with him, to pray to him, to sing to him, to delight in his word and to listen to his word faithfully read and preached. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it and open our worship this morning by uniting our voices together in song as we stand and sing 319, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Let's sing. Be seated, please, but don't put your hymnal away. Have a seat and turn to 607 as we continue to unite our voices in praise to our great God and reflect on his wondrous story, the story of his great gospel. 607, let's sing together all three verses.
good morning, brothers and sisters. Whether you're gathering here in this place or joining us online today, we bid you welcome, as does the peace and presence of Christ. It bids us welcome to come and to worship. Let's pray together and ask God to accept our praises. We're so glad you're here today. Gracious and loving God, as we gather here in this place or in homes, wherever we are, Lord, meet us there. Lord, we are carrying oftentimes heavy burdens, but what a joy to know that we can come just as we are and offer our prayers and our praises, even when it might seem difficult. And you, O oh Lord, you meet us. You bid us come. You seek us. So as we worship you today, as you, our good shepherd, is seeking each one of us, may you find us ready to praise and to honor you with all that we are and all that we have. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. We lift our voices as we read from God's word together from one of the last of the psalms in this altar, psalms that are all focused on praising our great God. Join me as we read from God's word together responsively. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, boys and girls, it is time for our children's sermon today. And if you're at home, feel free to move a little closer to the screen. And if you're here in our sanctuary, you can just hang out right where you are. Today, I want to talk to you about how Jesus was always looking out for the lonely. All throughout his ministry, Jesus was noticing people who maybe didn't have a lot of friends. He was looking out for those who maybe were sick and no one wanted to be around them. Every day, Jesus was seeking people who felt alone. And you know, we, as followers of Jesus, are called to do that, too. I know about this wonderful thing that they do in some schools called Buddy Bench. And you may have one at the school where you go to. It's a bench where if someone who's playing on the playground doesn't have a friend, they can go and sit on the bench. And then there's some buddies who notice that that person needs a friend to play with. And so they walk over and ask them, to come and play. And this got me thinking, you know, we might not have a buddy bench at our school or when we go play somewhere at a park, but we can be people who notice the lonely just like Jesus did. 
We can be people who are watching and looking out and seeing the people who need God's love. As followers of Jesus, that's what we're supposed to do, to notice the lonely and to share love and kindness with them. So if your school doesn't have a buddy bench, maybe you could talk to some of the teachers and the leaders and see if you could get one on the playground. But until then, keep watching and looking and noticing those who may be lonely and asking them to be friends with you. For that's what Jesus taught us to do. Let's pray and ask God for help with that. Loving God, help us to notice the lonely. Help us to see those who feel sad, who are struggling. Help us to be people who share your love. Help us to be buddies and friends and those who share our time. Help us to be your hands and feet in the world. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.
us pray together. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in all of us. Be with us, God, in everything that we have going on in our respective lives. We do admit that it is very noisy in this time, but yet we're so thankful that you are so expansive that you cover us, God, with peace, with love, and most of all, with hope. And so God, we pray that you would be our constant reminder of this love, this peace, and this hope. Help us, God, even in the trials to see you, in the tribulations to feel you, and even when it seems hopeless, make us hopeful. We pray, Lord God, that you would be with all the healthcare professionals that are serving in this time. Give them endurance, give them patience, give them purpose, oh God. We pray, Lord God, for our teachers and our parents, God, who is very noisy and hurtful in some ways, God. Give them peace, remind them of your steadfast love. We pray, Lord God, for our world, that you will continue to cover it, God, cover it with your provision, with your hope and with your peace. And so, Lord God, as we have gathered today for worship, either here or online, we count it a privilege and joy to be able to worship such a great God like you. And so now, God, we pray that the songs that are continuously sung and the word that will be faithfully preached may edify us, God, and give us more hope and remind us of your faithfulness, O oh God. We pray, Lord God, that you may build us up where we feel worn or torn down. May you silence the noise, God, and help us to see your wondrous works. We pray, Lord God, for just hope. Hope, God, that this virus would end. Hope, God, that things would get better. Hope, God, that you would remind us every day that you're still on the throne and that through you we move and breathe and have our being, O oh God. And so God be with us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for everything you continuously do for us. These and other blessings we ask in your son Jesus Christ's name, amen. Remaining seated, join me as we sing 406, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Let's sing together.
During this past year, we've been faced with a lot of changes. I've watched a lot of you as you have been coming to church, as we've had the different Zoom meetings, as we've had the different telephone meetings. And I have witnessed an incredible amount of strength and courage and love and concern for others. I've watched you and I have been praying for you just as you've been praying for a lot of other people. And I would like to use some prayer today that I created for the nursing students several years ago, and I've adapted it for you because I would like for you to know how blessed you have been to me and to others in our church and our church faith community. Please pray with me as I use the concept of praying for hands. Bless these hands as they are used to display loving kindness to so many individuals. Bless these hands as they trust in the Lord and do good. Bless these hands as they demonstrate through giving a financial support for our church. Bless these hands that nurture hope in those who feel hopeless. Bless these hands because they offer peace. Bless these hands that feel the pain and suffering of others. Bless these hands as they be still and be with others. Bless these hands as they embrace others with compassion and passion. Bless these hands for their constancy in caring for others. Bless these hands that have joined with the eyes of the heart and the eyes of the head in touching the world through Jesus Christ. Bless these hands as they honor our shared humanity. Bless these hands in recognition of the holiness for what they do every day. Bless these hands for they are both the worker and the work of the hands of God. May God who formed these beautiful hands impart upon each person gathered together today the importance of being renewed and reawakened to the blessings of others through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
be seated, please. And as you're being seated, turn in your hymnal to open our eyes, open my eyes that I may see as we prepare our hearts to receive God's word. Let's sing together all of the verses of hymn 395. Two great stories today from Mark's Gospel, two miracle healings of Jesus back to back found in chapter 7 beginning in verse 24. From there Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Seraphonician origin. She begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hands on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears. 
and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more they, he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Several years ago, I was on vacation and just had entered into that happy, relaxed place. I'd spent the morning on the beach, had my sunglasses and my Grisham novel in one hand and my lounge chair. About lunchtime, I came up to the house where we were staying, pulled the chain on that outside shower thing and knocked off enough of the sand to go in, wrap a, wrapped a dry towel around me to go in to fix some lunch. Leftover bacon from breakfast, Tomato in season, Duke's mayonnaise, and fresh bread. And life was so good. So I'm wrapped up, had my BLT in one hand, I had my Grisham novel in the other, and then I thought, I might ought to just go check my cell phone before I start lunch. And I went to the bedroom. There's missed call after missed call. Vicky from the office, text messages, voicemails, somebody I needed to call right then, that afternoon, urgent. Now, sometimes we try to get away, it just doesn't always work out. Which means you and I might be sympathetic to Jesus in this story who needed to get away from the onslaught of demands that just kept coming and kept coming. Jesus is divine, but Jesus has a nervous system. Jesus needs retreat, time away. And so he's gone away into the Gentile region of Tyre, kind of with his head down a little bit. He doesn't want anybody to know he's there. But He's Jesus, and the miracle workers in town and word does get out, of course. So before he can even kick off his sandals and begin a little downtime, there stands right in front of him a determined, fixed Gentile mother on a mission. She tells him that her daughter is being tormented by a demon, and she begs him to perform just one of his miracles on her. Just one, just this one time, I'll leave you alone, I'll be on my way. But Jesus, as you know, is a Jewish rabbi. He's on a Jewish mission. And unsettling as it is, and it is unsettling, Jesus uses a, a dinner time image, a kind of familiar dinner time image, as a way of saying that his focus, his primary mission, is inside the Jewish community. Let the children be fed first. For it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it under the table for the little dogs. Oh, this mother doesn't go away. Feet planted. This Gentile, Gentile woman doesn't assume that the Gentiles ought to have priority. She doesn't appeal that his mission should include her and others. But she is a mother. This is a mother with a hurting child. If you've ever had a child in pain, you know what this is like. Is there any wall you wouldn't knock down? Is there any more determined force on the planet than a mother on a mission for a hurting child so she doesn't whimper away? Instead, she stands toe to toe and says to Jesus, Sir, even the little dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And in the face of her determination, Jesus says, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. 
And the mother goes home and finds the little girl playing and smiling and well. With one notable exception, the, the time Jesus meets the man in the tombs, this is the first time Jesus interacts with somebody who's not Jewish, which is a good day for you and me, that Jesus has now extended his ministry, drum roll please, to a Gentile woman in a pagan city. The game has officially changed. Well, who knows how long Jesus got to stay in the borrowed bedroom. Hopefully he gets some retreat, but then he takes off toward the Sea of Galilee to another unclean area in the region of the Ten Cities. And here we go again. He's among the Gentiles again. And you know that in his tradition, contact with the Gentiles makes him unclean. And here comes a group of guys holding the elbow of a deaf man whom they introduce to Jesus. Now the man can't hear thunder, so he can't hear how people form their words either, which means that his attempts at speech are impaired too. And when he talks, he screeches. It's almost too painful to hear. And the friends beg Jesus on behalf of this man, lay your hands on him and heal him. And Jesus touches the man, he puts his fingers in his ear. And then he spits on his finger and he puts it on the man's tongue. Keep in mind, we're not during a pandemic at this point. And then looking up to heaven, he sighs and says, be opened. And at that moment, ears open, plain speech, astonished crowd. He makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So here we have two healings. Back to back in Mark's gospel, both Gentiles, both in unlikely regions for the king of the Jews... One's healed of a demon, likely a, 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 an ailment of the spirit. The other is healed of death, deafness, a physical limitation. One male, one female. One touched, the other's not touched. Neither is named. But here's the little detail that kind of winked up at me this week. Both of these people are healed because somebody else cared enough to be part of their healing. The little girl didn't chase down Jesus. Her mother showed up at that house. The, the deaf man didn't pull on Jesus' robe and point to his ears. It was a group of friends who intervened on his behalf. Now, I don't want to veer too far from Mark's purpose here. Mark is clearly trying to establish that the power of Jesus' power to transform and to heal. And as a part of this story, as Mark tells it, Jesus looks up into heaven. Mark's warning us to not miss that God is the source of this transformative power of Jesus. These stories are about Jesus and about God's power flowing through him. Nobody else in the story even gets a name. But still, I think it's worth noting the role of the mother and the friends. The little girl and the deaf man both had caring advocates who risked something to be part of somebody else's healing. And usually it is risky. Usually to move yourself into somebody else's story and somebody else's healing comes with some risk. Inter intervening in somebody else's life might not even be welcome. 
<laughs> when Melissa and I were dating, we went to a petting zoo at Stone Mountain one time. We did the little area with the sheep and the rabbits, and as I recall, a goat chewed on her straw pocketbook. But then there was, a, there was another area, it was kind of a split rail fence, and just beyond the split rail fence were the larger animals, llamas and alpacas and ponies and such. So you weren't supposed to go across the fence, you'd go up to the fence, and when they came, you'd pet them as they came by. Well, a little girl, about three years old, had slipped somehow beyond her mother, and in her childish delight, she's just blissful as she can be, she goes through the split rail fence to go pet one of the ponies. As I said, she was blissful, but I thought she might be in some danger, and I'm eager to impress Melissa. We hadn't been dating that long. So I wanted to show my heroism. So I ran in with no regard for my personal safety to snatch this young child out of danger. Well, I mentioned that the child was blissful, and that was true until she saw a man running after her. That's when she screamed. And when she screamed, about the time I snatched her up, it was that scream that then got her mother's attention. And her mother looked up, and all her mother saw of this story was a man she did not know snatch up her daughter and take off. Eventually, you'll be glad to know uh, that Mo with Melissa as a character witness, we were able to calm this woman down of all of her abduction fears, and it, was, it, it turned out okay. It was ugly for a while. My, my point is that even our best attempts at intervening with care come at some risk. It's not always welcome. Some skeptics believe or say that they would believe in God if only they got to witness a miracle, like a healing. But I see healings all the time. And guess what? They almost always include the involvement of some caring soul who risked something to put themselves out for somebody else's healing. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, a group of haggard caregivers come here to Second Ponce and drop off a loved one. The ones they are dropping off have Alzheimer's, and, and they're enrolled in the program here that's sponsored by seven congregations up and down the Peachtree Corridor. For several hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays, volunteers take over the role of caregiver. And then that allows the, the primary caregiver to go run errands or get some rest. But what's happening is somebody's intervened so healing can take place in that family. The family sat down with their mother. It was tear-filled and risky. With the minister present, they told her that her drinking problem was killing the family. They told specific stories of neglect and danger and worry, and they insisted that she go inpatient to get help with her destructive disease. And somebody risked, intervened, so healing could take place. The, the hospital where my daughter works, as you might imagine right now, is overrun with COVID patients. It's completely full, all ICU beds. They have some patients out in the hall. And during one, at one point during COVID, the hospital ran out of oxygen. They ran out of oxygen. Well, until the problem could be fixed, the only thing they could do 
to keep people on their oxygen was to bag them temporarily. You know the, the little hand move bagging kind of thing, hand pump. There are not enough nurses and doctors anyway. There are surely not enough nurses and doctors to have them all pumping, giving somebody oxygen, right? So my, daughters and, uh, my daughter and others went up and down the hospital corridors recruiting orderlies and food personnel, anybody they could find, took them into rooms and taught them how to bag a patient in need of oxygen. I'm not, I'm not even sure that's legal. But somebody intervened so healing could take place. Somebody in this room called me recently for lunch. We had a blessing. We unwrapped our tacos. He said to me, this is an odd role for me. I've never been older than my pastor. He said, and the reversal of this conversation is uncomfortable to me. But how are you doing? Are you okay? Somebody intervened so healing could take place. She didn't know what to say to her friend. Her friend had just filed for divorce. 42 years old, three children under 10. She didn't know any of the details. She didn't even know whose fault it was, if it's anybody's fault, who knows. The easy thing to do, though, is to just ignore it, just go silent. Besides, you could say something wrong, you could... And it's her marriage, after all. It's not any of my business. But then she risked, and she called, and she said, can I just come over one morning next week for coffee? I don't know what's going on, but I, I just figured you could use a friend right now. And somebody intervened so healing could take place. When Jesus put his fingers in the deaf man's ears, when he, when he put his finger on his tongue, when the healing happened, the scripture says that Jesus looked up to heaven and sighed and then said to the man, be open. Healing happens by the power of God. We know that. But as we saw in today's story, in most cases, God's healing gets brokered by the compassion of unnamed people who risk getting involved. God's healing is still play, taking place. It's taking place all over. And it usually involves somebody being vulnerable enough to enter the messy and emotional places where healings take place. May we be the church, partners with God in God's healing, loving, redemptive mission in the world. Amen. we conclude our worship service this morning, let's finish our service with music that we heard at the beginning of this service, standing. As we sing together, I heard the voice of Jesus say, 577, stand and join me.
Three things before we leave. The first, congratulations, we were this close. Thanks to your generosity on the ambitious summer giving goal, we made 420,000 of our $450,000 goal, which says something about this church. Scattered as we are, still not all in the same room across TV screens and laptops, there is still a level of commitment that we come together and do what we need to do to further the gospel. So my thanks to you all for that. Next Sunday, you will probably want to bring a friend. It's going to be so much fun. Next Sunday's Bible presentation. Heather is preaching next week. We're going to introduce Allie, our new children's ministry intern. She's going to do the children's sermon while Heather, because Heather's going to be preaching. It's going to be a good day. And next Sunday, this is my third thing. Don't make immediate lunch plans because we're going to go have lemonade on the lawn together when we get out of here so that we can take these masks off and safely uh, be with each other and catch up on each other for a while before we scatter. So make a little extra time next week. But now, Go in the assurance that God is still in the business of healing this broken world. And go and join God in this miracle of restoration. And go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.